It's a great time to be an astronomer nowadays. And uh, this is mainly because we've had some incredible developments in astronomy. And I'm just going to say two main big ones. The first is the detection of gravitational waves from merging black holes or neutron stars black holes. That's the first one. The second very important uh, discovery that we've been doing is we have discovered, scientists have discovered how to image a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy. So in this talk, I'm just going to talk about the second one, how we are detecting and imaging the centers of galaxies. Now, before I start that, I'm just going to take, take you back a step and describe what is a black hole. Classically, the definition which you'll see all over the internet is a black hole is a place in space-time where no light can escape. It's like so compact and so massive that light cannot escape. Now, uh, to just uh, explain this a little more, if you recall, there's something called escape velocity. So if you have a body with a mass, a gravitational mass, then and you have a satellite going around it, then to escape from that gravitational field, you need an escape velocity. But you can't go faster than the speed of light. So if any mass is so dense and so massive that it does not allow light to escape, that means the velocity, escape velocity is larger than light, then it becomes what we call a black hole. Now this term is not new. It's been around since the 1780s. It's been around for several hundred years. But it was really became popular by John Wheeler in the 1960s, who announced it, kind of you know, threw it out in the air, black hole, and it stuck. And what it means is that the source that we are seeing does not emit emission. And that makes it very difficult to detect. Mathematically and observationally, these two ways, we can think about a black hole. Now, mathematically, a lot of work has done on black holes. And basically, it's treated as a singularity. It's a place where everything blows up in space time. Now, this came out from. Einstein's the, uh, general theory of relativity. One of the solutions, the, the first solution, the Schwarzschild metric, blew up when you came close to an object which was very massive and which was very compact. And the escape velocity, if it became equal to the speed of light, the solution could not work. So you see the beauty of the physics. You can use classical Newtonian mechanics to come to the concept of escape velocity and black hole, but you can use, also use the GR equation to come to the same concept. Now, uh, after that, uh, there were several studies which tried to see if this concept was real. And where it is real is the most massive objects in our universe, the stars. When a star collapses, it, if it's very massive, it can go on to become a singularity or a black hole. So I'm going to describe these two concepts in the coming minutes. Now, before that, let me just, just show you what we think a black hole looks like. Now, a black hole has three aspects which are very important. The first aspect is that there is an event horizon. And that's like the radius of no return. Once any object comes close beyond the event horizon, it's swallowed up or sucked in by the black hole. It, there is no way it comes out. So that means that if light is near or gas mass is near a black hole, then if it has some angular momentum, it will circular, go in circular orbits, and finally be absorbed by the black hole. The second concept, which is very important, is the bending of light. Now, space-time near a black hole becomes curved. And what this means is that the light, which we think should just directly come to us, can be bent by space-time and may go around. And so we may be actually be able to see the backside of the black hole in curved space-time. And this was shown very early on in 1990 by Eddington, who, during a solar eclipse, showed that the stars, the light from the stars near the sun, that they get bent so that there is a small deflection in the position of the stars near the sun. So the third concept, which also has some relevance here, is the last stable circular orbit. Because when matter falls near a black hole, 
it will have some angular momentum usually, and so it will form a disk, an accretion disk, and it can form, still move in circular orbits only up to three times the event horizon. So these are the three concepts. There's been a huge amount of theoretical work, very nicely summed up in uh, a book or several books by our own uh, uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. But I will not go into that. I think for our talk here, these three concepts are enough. Now the second thing I want to also tell you, the second way of looking at a black hole is the end state of stars. Now we know in our universe that galaxies are composed of stars and the stars can have a variety of masses. They can be small like the mass of our sun or they can be massive, 20 times the mass of our sun. The very massive stars will use up their fuel very fast in nuclear fusion. They'll burn through the fuel and at the end they throw out the outer layers of the star in what is called a supernova explosion. Supernova is a term I'm sure most of you have heard of. When there is a supernova explosion, at the heart, there will be a remnant. And if that remnant is very massive, it will keep on contracting. It may stop at a neutron star, which later on may give out pulses, and you'll see a pulsar. Or it will keep on contracting and form a singularity, which we know as the black hole. So you see, it's been predicted from theory, but we can also see it in reality using telescopes. Now, that means that in galaxies which have billions and trillions of stars, we should see a large amount of black holes because uh, the massive stars would have evolved and formed black holes. But in a galaxy, the most massive black hole lies in the center, the heart of the galaxy. Because the center of a galaxy is where the center of the potential is. That's where the deepest point in the potential lies. And that's where the massive black hole lies. And this black hole can have a mass which is uh, a million times the mass of the sun and even 10, uh, a trillion, a trillion times the mass, actually 10 to the power 10, which is like 10 times a trillion. Now these massive black holes can't have formed from the end state of stars. We don't think so. And actually the question is open. We still don't know how the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies form. Maybe they were formed in primordial times. We are still, people are still examining all those questions. So the massive, the most massive uh, black holes in our universe lie at the centers of galaxies. And there are spiral galaxies, there are elliptical galaxies. The elliptical galaxies have the most massive black holes. And the two black holes, supermassive black holes that I'll show you in today, they lie, the first one lies in the center of our galaxy, which is a spiral galaxy. The second one lies at the center of an elliptical galaxy, which is a very massive galaxy, M87, the most uh, massive galaxy in our nearby, soul, uh, nearby neighborhood. Now, how can we detect? A good question would be, how can we detect a black hole? I mean, in the universe, we detect stars and, um, uh, and ga uh, gas, gas clouds and stars, mainly through the emission that they emit. The emission can come from all over the electromagnetic spectrum, from visible to infrared, radio, but a black hole does not emit. So the only way to detect a black hole is through its effect on the surrounding. It will, number one, as I mentioned, it will bend space-time, give a curvature. Number two, it will also affect the motion of particles around it, and those particles are stars. So that is the first way of detecting a black hole, tracing the orbits of stars around a black hole. Another way that we can detect and examine a black hole is by looking at all the gas that is falling into the black hole. Because when matter falls into the black hole, it becomes ionized, it's hot. And if it's hot, we all know hot plasma has electrons moving at relativistic speeds. They will give out radiation. Radiation, which we call synchrotron radiation, which can be detected using radio telescopes. So these are the two main uh, uh, methods by which we study supermassive black holes. Number one is the tracing the stellar orbits. And number two, looking at the emission. So first, let me talk about the tracing of stars, stellar orbits around our supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. 
Now, the Ars Galaxy Center was known to have a supermassive black hole many, many years ago, sometime in the 1970s. And that's because there was a very compact radio source in the center. And this compact radio source, which everyone called Sagittarius A star, was not really a star. That was clear. It was some compact source which gave out a lot of energy. And it was identified positionally with the center of our galaxy. So when these two teams, uh, Reinhard Genzel in Germany, Max Planck, and uh, Andrea Guess in U UCLA in the US, when they started studying the center of our galaxy, they looked at stars around this point, around Sagittarius A star. Now, this may seem actually fairly trivial. You say, OK, you've got a telescope. You look at the stars. But the center of our galaxy is very, very far away. And so they had to have not only very powerful telescopes, they had to also compensate for the effect of the atmosphere, because the atmosphere kind of uh, scatters all the light we get from a star. They also had to look for certain types of stars which were close to Sagittarius A star. And so they did that. And they found about 30 stars. And when you get stellar orbits, when you fi find the stellar orbits, what you can do is you can look at simulations, at analytical work, and then create a model of the potential. That potential will give the mass of the black hole. And so that's what they did. They were able to determine, estimate the mass of the black hole in the center of our galaxy through the orbits of stars in the galactic center. And for this, very deservedly, they got the Nobel Prize, both of them, both the groups, in 2020. And I think one of the quotes by Reinhard Genzel was that detecting the black hole in the center of our galaxy was a confirmation that Einstein's theories of general relativity are correct. Because you see, everything has come from that equation, from that, those metrics derived from that equation. So that was a very wonderful discovery. However, about a decade ago, 2010, 11, or even before that, people started discussing that We've detected a black hole, but why can't we image it? Now, imaging is even harder because no light is coming out. But matter is going in. And when matter falls into the black hole, it usually has some angular momentum and forms what we call an accretion disk. And an accretion disk in the center around the black hole is very hot. There's a lot of hot plasma there. There's ions. There's electrons, again, moving at very high speeds giving out radio emission. And that radio emission is what can be imaged. So when they say the black hole shadow, it's not really a shadow. What they're doing is they are Im imaging the hot gas falling into the black hole. So now this is not a, a, a trivial matter, because uh, uh, first of all, it's very far away. All these black holes are very far away. So they decided to focus on two nearby galaxies. The first is the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And the second is in M87, which is a nearby elliptical galaxy. Now, M87 has a massive accretion disk. It's a massive black hole. And so it's got a very bright emission in the center. So it was easier to observe, but it was very far away. Our galaxy, however, was nearby. Now, technology-wise, technology it was very challenging. Because what they had to do was they used a wavelength of light, millimeter waves, in the radio regime. They used millimeter wave emission coming from the black hole. And they had to use telescopes, which were very large distances apart. Now, that's really hard. I mean, you can't build a telescope more than a few hundred meters in diameter. Structure-wise, structure you can't support it. So what they did was they used a te technique called VLBI, Very Large Baseline Interferometry. And what VLBI does is it takes the Earth's rotation as a baseline for the telescope. So what they did was they used telescopes in the US. They used them in the South Pole, uh, in Europe, all over the world. And all over the world, as the Earth rotates, these telescopes would be observing either the galactic center or M87. And then they, they got huge amounts of data. And the data amounts were so large that they had to collect them in disks and ship it 
from one place to the other. But when they did this, they collected all the data and then they combined it, they stacked it. And because the signal was very weak, I mean, you know, you can't even imagine how weak it was. So you had to stack an enormous amount of data. And this is where technology was so important. Because the ideas may have come from astronomers, but the technique, the actually doing the whole experiment, needed computer scientists and engineers. So I believe the final result came from a computer scientist who was able to actually get all the data together and simulate the image of the uh, gas around the black hole. So the first one that they released in 2017 was M87. And the whole image of the black hole there, it looks like a vada or a donut. So basically inside there's a hole, which is where the black hole is, and you're not going to be able to see it. But around it, you can see the gas, which is giving out emission as it is falling into the black hole. Now, this ring, as you see it, will not be uniform. It will have a certain non-uniformity. And that's because of the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is something we all learned in school. You know, when a signal comes towards us, moves away from us, the frequency changes. In astronomy, the light even gets boosted. So that's why some parts of the ring appear brighter than the other part. It's due to Doppler boosting. Now, the second target that they released only this April was the uh, image of the black hole of our galactic center. And this, as I mentioned earlier, M87 has a very massive black hole, and it has a very massive accretion disk. It has nice radio jets. But our black hole in our galaxy is very quiet. And so they had to really stack a lot of emission and get the black hole. But it was similar, as you can see, it was similar in view. And when you compare the two, the black hole in the center of M87 and in our galaxy, they look very similar, but the scales are very, very different. So I'm so glad to be talking about this at an institute of technology, because without technology, science nowadays cannot proceed, and especially astronomy.